Let me ask you about gun control. The question is, are you okay with a little gun control? Did you know that some citizens, not just convicted felons, are prohibited from owning or possessing any firearms? Under current federal law, the Second Amendment rights of those who are the subject of a civil domestic violence protective order are automatically suspended. However, that might not be the case for very long. Right now, the U.S. Supreme Court is deciding whether a person who has recently committed domestic violence should get their gun ownership rights back. Let's talk about the poster child for this potentially huge change in the law and then examine how the court might resolve this. In December 2019, Zaki Rahimi and his girlfriend had an argument in a parking lot in Arlington, Texas. She tried to leave, but Rahimi assaulted her and forced her into the car. Realizing that a bystander had seen him, he retrieved a gun and fired a shot. In the meantime, the girlfriend escaped the car and fled the scene. Rahimi later called her and threatened to shoot her if she told anyone about the assault. Oh, it gets much worse. The girlfriend then files for a domestic violence protective order in family court, which Rahimi agreed to. Part of that order, pursuant to Texas law, Rahimi was prohibited from possessing any firearm for as long as the order was in effect, which was to be for two years. Over the next year, he threatened another woman with a gun and participated in five more shootings. The shootings were for road rage, someone talking trash on social media, and then because his friend's credit card was denied. Rahimi was then convicted for being in possession of a firearm in violation of 18 U.S.C. section 922G8 and sentenced to six years in prison. He then immediately appealed the conviction to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. The Fifth Circuit Court actually granted the appeal and overturned the conviction. Why is this such a big deal? Well, this wasn't some ultra-liberal West Coast or New York Court of Appeals. The Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals is one of the most conservative appellate courts in the country, which establishes controlling case law for Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi. After a 2022 Second Amendment rights victory in the U.S. Supreme Court, we were provided a new and very strict framework in which gun control laws must be analyzed. Using this framework, the Fifth Circuit Court considered the historical tradition of firearm regulation and found that this domestic violence gun control law was a violation of Rahimi's constitutional rights. That leads us to the U.S. Supreme Court battle, where the state is now trying to reverse the Fifth Circuit's ruling because that ruling has created a ripple effect throughout the country. Historically, the Second Amendment has been interpreted to protect an individual's right to bear arms. However, this right has never been absolute. Precedents have established the government's authority to impose certain restrictions, especially when public safety is at stake. The key challenge in this case lies in balancing historical interpretations with modern concerns of domestic violence and likely the overall moral decay in our society. Traditionally, laws have been implemented to disarm individuals who pose a threat, reflecting society's agreement on the need to balance individual rights with community safety. The state's argument leans heavily on this historical context, asserting that restricting firearm access for individuals under domestic violence protective orders is a continuation of these long-standing practices. In contrast, the defendant argues that there is no substantial historical precedent for such extensive restrictions, especially when applied to individuals who have not been criminally convicted. This perspective highlights a potential gap between historical practices of disarmament and the contemporary application of the law. The Supreme Court's decision in this case will not only address the constitutionality of the current law, but will also set a precedent for how historical contexts are used to interpret the Second Amendment. The state filed a brief in this case, which we'll link below, setting out their argument. The state argues this law is a necessary measure for public safety, especially in the context of domestic violence. The state contends that this law is consistent with the Second Amendment and cites historical precedents permitting the regulation of firearms to prevent harm to individuals and society. They argue that individuals subject to domestic violence protective orders represent a clear risk, justifying the need to disarm in order to protect potential victims. The state contends that such restrictions have been a part of American legal tradition when public safety is at risk. This argument is grounded in the belief that certain limitations on the Second Amendment are permissible and necessary to safeguard the community, especially vulnerable individuals. The state wants to establish a precedent that affirms the government's authority to impose restrictions on gun ownership in scenarios where there is a risk to public safety. The defendant also filed a brief in this case setting out his argument, 
which we'll also link below. The defendant argues that this law is overly broad and that this prohibition on firearm possession by individuals under domestic violence protective orders infringes upon his fundamental right to bear arms. The defendant points out that these domestic violence protective order hearings can be held with only 48 hours notice and that the parties are not entitled to a court-appointed attorney if indigent. The defendant's argument pivots on the lack of historical precedent for such extensive restrictions, especially those applied to individuals who have not been criminally convicted but maintain their freedom and are only subject to civil court orders. By focusing on the constitutional right to bear arms, the defendant's stance underscores the significance of individual liberties as enshrined in the Second Amendment. He argues that the law in question fails to strike a proper balance between public safety and constitutional rights, leading to an overreach that unfairly penalizes individuals who retain their civic rights. The current makeup of our U.S. Supreme Court is six conservative-leaning justices versus three liberal-leaning justices. If the justices rule in the same manner they did in the 2022 Bruin decision, then it will be Roberts, Alito, Thomas, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Barrett versus Sotomayor, Kagan, and Jackson, which Jackson presumably ruling the way Breyer did in that opinion. During oral arguments in this case, Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Barrett both seem to be critical of the defendant's position. Well, and how do you know? I mean, I think there would be little dispute that someone who was um, guilty, say, or even had a restraining order, that domestic violence is dangerous. Okay. Well, to the but, extent that's pertinent, you don't have any doubt that your client's a dangerous person, do you? Your Honor, I would want to know what dangerous person means. At well, the it moment. means someone who's shooting, uh, uh, you know, at people. Uh, that's a good start. So, so... It, <laughs> and they could ultimately rule along with the more liberal justices. Regardless of the outcome, the Supreme Court's eventual ruling in this case will have significant implications for gun ownership laws that either puts guns back into the hands of abusers or justifies some measure of gun control. So I began with the question, are you okay with a little gun control? What do you think? Should those who commit family violence get their second amendment rights back? Or are you in favor of these laws prohibiting their gun ownership?